edition. Oh, hey, Shabbat Shalom. I was just singing. I'm so excited to see you this Shabbat. <laughs> and Reverend Sharon Dittmar. I'm Robert Barr. We're glad you're here. Big rainstorm in Cincinnati makes yes. everything chaotic. Yes. But we are here and we are ready. And we're going to take a breath. <sighs> right? Do you want to start reading? Will that calm you down? Or do you want me to start reading? <laughs> no, I'll read. That okay. sounds lovely. And to remember this is a special time. Right. Put away the pencil and paper. Put away the notebook and keys. Set aside the shovel and hammer. Rest. For this interval, no buying, no selling, no working, no laboring, no straining, not living in the past, not planning for the future. This is a time for celebration, for joy, for mirth. We are here alive to rejoice in another Sabbath, another opportunity to be together, grateful for our family and friends. With no distractions, we touch and are touched the great gift of the Sabbath. So as I said, I'm Robert Barr, I'm Reverend Sharon Dittmar, and we are delighted that you're here sharing this Shabbat service with us. Those of you who've joined us before know that ourjewishcommunity.org gives a voice to a bold Judaism, a Judaism that responds to what it means to be a modern person. While we value our ancestors, we recognize that the world that they lived in was remarkably different than the world we lived in. Mm. They were responding to the world around them, but they had limited understanding of, of the place that they live, the universe in which they uh, existed, they had limited understanding of nature itself. But we've acquired knowledge, and that demands that we then respond to it with both uh, an inquisitive mind, a curiosity, a sense of, of appreciation for the knowledge that we have. And I think it requires of us that we, we change the language that we speak. Mm. That the, le the words that, that they use were the lens through which they understood the world, and, and our lens is different. So we need to, mm. to mean what we say and see what we say what we mean. So our Jewish community is all about that. It's, it's part of our the congregation Beth Adam in, in, in Loveland, Ohio. And we recognize that technology has allowed us to create a community that spans the globe. Uh, it's a microphone that allows us to, to, to speak louder and to connect to more people and to create community. So whether you're here live at 6 o'clock and you're chatting right now or you're watching this in archives, which we know actually the majority of people do, we're glad you're here. You're, we're glad you're part of this community. We're glad that you have found that this voice of Judaism speaks to who you are and speaks to your identity. So we're going to continue with our candle lighting and then a conversation. On this Shabbat, we create our moment in time. We pause, reflect upon our yesterdays and tomorrows to, to renew our ties with family and friends, to restore our energies, to refresh our spirits. Yes. As the sun descends and shadows lengthen, the direction of the day gives way to the stillness of night. It is time now for us to see not with our eyes, but with our hearts and minds. As the day gives way to evening, it is time for us to welcome the Shabbat. The candles stand before us, waiting to be lit. Recall our ancestors as we too seek to dispel the darkness and banish the cold, to, to bring glowing softness, warmth, and safety into our homes. May the dancing flames of these candles kindle warmth in our hearts, wisdom in our minds, passion in our souls. Baruch or ba'olam, blessed is the light within the world. Baruch or ba'adam, blessed is the light within each person. Baruch or ba'shabbat, blessed is the light of the Sabbath. So every time that Reverend Dittmar has been joining us this year, uh, we've talked about the fact that uh, the Unitarians that you use have a suggestion of the month. Correct. Topic. And we've been on and off, we've been using those. We mm -hmm. used wonder, we talked about gratitude, we talked about resilience, we talked about revelation. Tonight we're going to talk about Tradition, in the spirit of Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> you just love that part, don't I you? I do. I was going to start singing. <laughs> I, it is taking all of my energy. I bet they want to hear you no. sing a little. No, they probably don't. But And there's a new revival of Fiddler on the Roof, too. On, Where? On Broadway. Oh. Yeah, I think he starts out wearing a... Uh, uh, like a vest, a, a modern day sort of uh, oh. vest. I, I, don't, I haven't seen it, but, but I do think there's a revival. Hmm. But tradition, tradition. Do you know we had the soundtrack when I was a child? 
Really? In my incredibly Presbyterian household, we had the soundtrack to Fiddler on the Roof. I could sing every song with you. So, I actually I know one of the 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 actors in it. She was, really? um, yeah, she's a friend of my brother's out in California. So, uh, uh, she played uh, one of the daughters. Far, she sang "Far from the Home Land I Love." Oh, there's Hava. There's I can't remember. Hava. I, oh, Hava. But I can't remember her. I know her. her None. There's the young one, the old yeah, one, so. the middle one. But but beyond that, so how did it sound as a Presbyterian, as a Jew? I mean, I'm just curious. <laughs> no, no, seriously, because I think you know when I watch Fiddler on the Roof. While it wasn't the Judaism that I knew, because it was sort of oh, orthodoxy, yes. what I mean, but my grandparents came from Europe. I mean, and, and we actually have, it's funny, you know, you've been to our condo. There's a. I have, have not. You've not? Oh, shame on you. <laughs> no! <laughs> no but you get invited like 14 times, and she never shows up. She disses me every time. That's not but we actually have. Complicated. A, but we have a but we have a, a, a an image from 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 that era, not oh, a photo, wow. you know sort of a, a drawing. So so you know when we listened to Fiddler on the Roof and tradition, and I think teachers referenced it. So it was sort of part of the cultural sort of norm that we were growing up in. It was sort of reference point. So as a Presbyterian, it must have sounded different. Uh, we even went to the movie, I, and this uh, I I can't. My parents were so mainstream middle class northern ohio presbyterian and we went and the dream sequence scared i had to take i had to leave the theater i was so scared by really? the dream sequence so yeah, you, i was little so if you've never seen it you need to you, you should look at it it was so fiddler on the roof is actually an adaptation of uh shalom alechem's seven sisters i believe actually mm -hmm. there so and they it was then created into the play and then eventually the movie but it's based upon shalom alechem what's interesting about it is shalom alechem that's his pen name, I got, was writing about the tension between actually tradition and modernity. Hmm. And that's really when you really watch it. I can see it, that. When you, it's, it's done with a sadness to it. So, oh, you know, yes. Sh Sh Shalom Alechem was like a more of a Sam Levinson kind of a humorist, hmm. you know, sort of gentle and sweet. There were other Yiddish writers of the period that were, were much more pointed and, 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 and energetic and perhaps even using the word angry. But if you think about, if you've not seen the movie, there's the, 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 the daughters begin to get married and there's the traditional one who marries the man that the father picks and there's the daughter who says, no, 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 I don't want you to pick my husband. I want to marry for love, which when this was done, you think married for love is pretty, is relatively new. And was considered risky. Right, right. People thought it was better that parents could pick mm -hmm. and there was economics involved. But that the father had a struggle with, right? And then there was the daughter who wanted to marry an Anjou, which in that time was pre and tore the family apart. And you begin to see families were changing. The three sisters, yeah. the three daughters in the movie, represent sort of the transition of Judaism. And then they had to leave their village, village Anatafka. Which is very heartbreaking. Right. And it, even I could pick that up as a kid, that they were being forced to leave right, and yep. that that wasn't fair. And I always remember the father, what do you pray for? To keep the czar far away from us. Right, right. Yeah, keep the powers of occupation far it, from us. So so the Jews, there were Jews who left in the late, you know, the 1800s during the pogroms. So there's so the Ashkenazi Jews mm -hmm. before the Holocaust. They left at a... At a Difficult period, but not the period that we would know as a Holocaust. So that's a, that's when like my grandparents came. And I always wonder if you think of if you extrapolate the lives, lives of the three daughters, what would have happened to them? Say at World War II, World right. War One, sure. World War Two, where right. where would they have been? What would they have been at risk for? But it's interesting in the Soul Matters material we have um, on tradition. It talks about what do you like about tradition and what don't you like. Like oh. what do you want to keep from your tradition and what from your tradition maybe holds you back? And I think. Actually, Fiddler on the Roof does a great job of lifting up all those questions, right. just in the characters. Right, yeah, because they were doing that, and, and, it, and it's hard because, you know, tradition can, I mean, the, the father, they had to give up their daughter for the sake of tradition. Yeah. And there's still families that are doing that, I mean, who give up their children. They're so angry that the children choose a path that is not a predefined, acceptable path. So among some Jews, and I'm sure other religions, uh, they, they consider their children as if dead. They were yes. no longer, what a horrible thing to do yeah. because of this notion of tradition. Uh, so what we're, Well, and it's uh, interesting too, because both you and I and our modern incarnations of faith challenge authority quite a bit. And so we tend to challenge tradition because often tradition is buttressed by authority. And so I loved this quote from the materials I had. 
and it's from a minister. I don't know who a UU minister. Tradition is the source of religious authority most suspect to Unitarian Universalists. Mm -hmm. And I think that is so true. And I wonder if you would say that would be true within oh, your congregation as well. Well, right, because I, what bothers me about tradition is when people use tradition, and, and, I, and, I, and I've done some work, not just, not just religious work, but really clubs and groups, and they say, oh, this is tradition. Mm. And I keep on saying, are you making a choice to embrace it, or do you think you have no choice but to embrace it? So you're abdicating your authority. It's a great question. Right? Because when, if people, if you like a tradition, if you, like, if you say, I like lighting candles on Shabbat, okay, I, I'm going to choose it. I'm using the tradition, but I pay, I'm not required to do it. But if somebody says to me, I'm required that men and women sit separately, mm -hmm. I have no choice. Tradition demands this of me. I think that's an abdication of responsibility and personal autonomy. Wow. That's intense. Well, it's interesting. I was working with um, uh, fraternities and sororities, and they had all kinds of traditions, right? And a lot of these traditions aren't so good. And I said, well, don't you have some responsibility to create a new tradition, a better tradition? Mm -hmm. Don't you have a responsibility to say the tradition that you've inherited is no longer valid? Not everyone feels they have the authority to do that, though. Which is interesting, too. Right. And some people don't. So, you know... Or, or, and some people don't want the authority, because it's a lot easier to treat if, if in, in a sex of sexism, let's say. It's a lot easier for me to say, you know what? Reverend, she's nice, but she's a woman, so we, how, much, how much does she really know about religion? Right? Because in, in the world of Anna Tefka, the filler on the roof... The women didn't go to services. Their voices weren't even supposed to be heard. No, they kind of went around and they, they, like, you know, the movie also presents the women going around the back of authority, sure. like the wife kind of caucusing the husband. But, you know, it's interesting. So in a, I, the tradition is a fascinating um, domain, particularly for tensions in a uh, multiracial, multicultural society like right. the United the United States is aspiring to be maybe where you live it is as well. But so, for example, I re uh, regularly run into imams and they have a very conflicted experience about I'm a female religious leader and they're glad to meet me. But can they touch me? Can they shake my hand? Do they not shake my hand? You know, for one of them, he's like, well, we'll just do this. We'll put our hands to our hearts and it's our symbol of greeting without us touching. And, you know, I don't think he feels he has authority to question his interpretation or the interpretation mm -hmm. of his community right. around the Quran. Do Orthodox clergy have rules about touching women too. So it's very Not interesting. Orthodox, or, Orthodox men. Orthodox men. And, okay. or, so in fact, yeah. in Israel, if you, so one of the things that you're not going to get to experience is we're not going to hit public transportation. That's just not the way it's going to work. We're going to be in business. because. Well, a lot of reasons. One, because we're on a tour, okay, so we have, right. yeah, so we're going to be on buses. But were and, there reasons around and, this and, dynamic well, too? Well, well, the reason you wouldn't typically, I mean, unfortunately, the because of terrorism, frankly, using okay. the bus system. I thought of that, too, but so, is there also about... Well, if you're in an... Orth if, if there, so the quickest confined space with someone oh, where you Oh, or there's some buses where the women are supposed to sit in the back. And an, okay. So if you sit... Yeah. To, if there's an Orthodox Jew, in fact, on the plane, this could happen on the plane. Okay, prepare me. If there's an Orthodox Jew sitting next, who's sitting next to you... I'm going to have to move. I wouldn't. I tell him to move. Or this is a big. This actually in Israel is a big an issue. Usually, particularly on flights that you know emanate out of places like, like New York. Toronto is a possibility. If there's a big Orthodox community flying, they there, there are fights now that have taken place on airlines. And the and particularly in Al Al, which is the Jew, the the Israeli. Yes. Where the pilot said, you know, I'm not tolerant. You can sit down. And you're going to sit in the seat, and we're taken off. But this has become an issue. Um, because men can't sit next to women. Do you see my eyes getting saucer wide? I really don't want to be in an, uh, a conflict as we're flying over, uh, overnight overseas, you know, yeah, trying no, not is, to touch elbows. Well, you know, that's their problem. And, and in fact, <laughs> I, gave a, I did a podcast about this. I said if somebody does not want to sit next to a woman, they should be required to buy three seats. The seat that they're going to sit in and the two seats on either side of them that they can keep empty. And they want to spend six or $8,000 to fly. That's their prerogative. But it's not their prerogative to say that they're not going to sit next to you. Wow, I have been tutored. I, I'm going to have to think about this. Here, let me ask you another question, though. Is, <laughs> is there something about your tradition that you love and you'd want to keep and wouldn't want to give away? Because tradition is not just bad. No, no, I think, well, I think that's interesting. I mean, the fact is I'm a rabbi, so mm -hmm. I keep a lot of traditions. I yeah. Mean, I, I, mean, in the, in the, I, I dispel a lot. I mean, I, mean, I don't, I, 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 I want to shape them to what makes sense to the world. Shabbat. I do it here. Mm -hmm. I 
don't do it a lot at home, right? Frankly, you know, we're busy. But you know, Passover, the holidays. There are there are traditions that are nice. Family gatherings. What's your they, favorite tradition? That's a. Are you asking in Judaism or just yeah, in Judaism? It, I think, for me, they've evolved because they've evolved mm. as family evolved. Well, what's your favorite now? We had a great Passover Seder this year at the congregation. Passover Seder was great. I haven't really Passover. See, it's also the difference, too, and this is, maybe you have this experience, too. So, and I, I'm rather, my mother had a real problem. My mother said to me when I was early, she said, well, you'll come home for Rosh Hashanah. I said, Mom, I'm a rabbi. I work on <laughs> Rosh Hashanah. And she went, oh, right, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, young, I, no, you know, you know, part of it is a lot of the traditions I'm now working. Yeah. Right? Which changes. I think bar and bat mitzvah is a great tradition. Yeah. How come? Because I think, it, I think, to my knowledge, and maybe you can correct me, you will, I know you will correct me, but I, I don't think there's any other religion that celebrates individual adolescence. Right? At 13. That's so interesting. I don't think, I don't, every time a minister or a priest have come here for a bar and bat mitzvah, they've all said to me that they don't know of a tradition where... They do. There are group rituals where there's correct, right? But nobody takes a twelve or thirteen year old kid and walks with them with specialized attention right. and a special Torah portion and right. And they yeah. and so a lot of people. And what we've done here is we've taken this tradition and said, okay, so for our ancestors, it was about adulthood. Well, the reality is, it isn't about adulthood anymore, mm. right? It's about acquiring uh, one's adulthood. It, it, we go through a process. So we talk about the transference of authority, that parents hold children's authority, and slowly we give it back to them. And during, Don't we, though? Right? Yes, yeah. we do. And that, we actually have a reading about that in the service, wow. where the parents talk about that. And I think our bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs here at the congregation, Beth Adam, are really quite powerful that way, in that they acknowledge both the dance and the tension. Right? Because yeah. parents, I mean, one of the things I say to the kids is, you know, your parents want to let you go, but they don't want to let you yes, go. Yes, of course. Right? It's that tension. We want, and we're scared. Yes. They, we're scared for them. We're scared for yes. us. There's a loss. Yes. Right? Your little, your baby goes over. You're looking, you're tearing up. <laughs> My son's 14. Right? I know. Right? So you tear up because you want your kids to go. You don't want the kids, but it is. He's it's, flying the nest. Right. And there is that sort of interest. So I think the bar about mitzvah, and I've been doing them for a long time, and I... I, there, there's a warmth and a meaningfulness to them that is very sweet because it's it's yeah. about that. And we're trying to instill in the kids certain skills. You know, if, if you think this is about acquiring, so we want skills like critical thinking skills. Well, and then what a fabulous tradition that it's been able to evolve somewhat, but it's still fulfilling this incredibly important role in families at a certain time and age in the lives of the children. Right. And I mean, what an incredible tradition then. I mean, that is so powerful. But we had to rethink it because it yeah. was becoming meaningless. Wow. I mean, I think for a lot of folks, it's become a party. Well, why is it a party? Because the, doing the oh, ceremony, right. right? Doing the ceremony. Yes, I've seen the photos. Yeah. It was becoming a party. Right. Because <laughs> the ceremony didn't mean there was nothing really intellectual or emotional yes. happening other than. You didn't have to do any work. No, I you got just had up, the party. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, even my bar mitzvah as a kid, I stood up, my parents sat in the front row. I read something in Hebrew that I worked months and months and months on so I could get it right. Yes. And that was it. There was nothing. If they, somebody had run up and, and grabbed me and thrown another 13-year-old boy in a blue suit on, I don't think anyone would have noticed. Because <laughs> there wasn't anything particularly Bob about it. It was... Oh, bar but you, you're different here. Right. Because if you've been to ours, yes, I mean, the, I kids, the kids read their own papers. They yes. Not just a paper like, this is my Torah portion. They actually research a topic and they explore yes. about what is meaningful. So we have two kids coming up. One is going to be talking about um, courage. And wow. he's used, he's going to talk about um, Moses. as he, we, we will pick whatever Torah portion fits the topic. But he wanted courage. And then he's going to talk about uh, Oscar Schindler and contrast Oscar Schindler who saved Jews. And don't they pull out the Torah that yeah. you have, and which is so moving. Right. And our Torah is so a, holo moving. Oh, it's a Holocaust. Right? Oh, it's so moving. And so there's another tradition, right. that Torah, like living, uh, crossing the sea, still going right. onward. Right. And talking about that. So I think there's ways. But when it became devoid of meaning, and I've seen them where the kid just gets up and reads and there's no connection, mm. there's no personality, there's no sense of the individuality, even though there's an individual child, I think it lost it. So we took the tradition, reshaped it, 
We, yeah. we rethought it. Um, what does it mean for us today about maturation and growth and change? So I think that it, it offered us something, but we had to rework it to make it meaningful. And I would say my favorite tradition in Unitarian Universalism is that we're a non-creedal faith. There's never been a faith statement you have to abide by in order to become a member. And so then a lot of people think we must not be a religion. Right. <laughs> and I said, no, no, but no, no. we have seven it? principles. But for me, that's important because I have an atypical religious belief. So I am a theist. But uh, I don't believe that God is all powerful. Right. I don't believe God is all knowing. So to me, that non creedal part really helps me continue to explore my faith without having to leave my mind behind or agree to something that I don't believe in. And it, it allows me to make room for people who have a faith unlike mine, which I actually really appreciate doing. I like learning from other people. You don't have to think what I think or believe what I think. I'm not worried about anyone's soul right. but, in that way. But I, when, when I hear the word tradition, yes, I think ritual or behavior more than I think thought. Well, you must understand Unitarian Universalists are just about the lowest ritual religion you could find in the United States of America. Right, no, no. So, but, so <laughs> we when really you don't that, have any. But, no, we I mean, have I, a few. We have do, a few. Just so a few. what is, is because when, so is there a, a excuse me, is there a ritual you like or a traditional ritual? Is there a ritual that you no, I mean, because we don't have confession. Um, we do, well, actually, yes, we do child dedications, okay? And isn't it interesting, this is about children, too. So we don't baptize them because we don't think they're going to go to hell, but we dedicate them to life. And I don't actually Cause... know when this tradition started for us, but it's unique, and it's a really lovely ceremony. What age? Welcome to the world. Oh, infants. But we can do up to, like, 10. Right. Is it also a naming simultaneously? Yeah. At the same time, you know, what name do you give this child? It's really sweet. And and you dedicate the child. That's interesting. So we do a naming. Mm -hmm. So we do. So it's interesting. I, okay. Because you know, it used to be a Brit Me Lies, a circumcision only for the boys. Mm -hmm. We moved away from that here. We do a naming for both boys and girls. And we also have a reading, usually by an older family member, about, I remember generations before you who you may not ever oh, know. Oh, so sweet. So it's, we may, I'd be interested in seeing your ceremony. I never, I didn't, never thought about that. Mm -hmm. um, any holiday rituals? <laughs> I, I'm laughing. You know, if you want to see people start flinching at a UU congregation, try discussing, like, try being the new minister and discussing, well, we're going to do Christmas here this year. Ooh, other people just, like, start to shiver. You know, uh, people worry, well, we shouldn't do it. And other people are like, what do you mean you're not going to do it? And some people are like, well, don't sing any Christmas carols. And other people will be like, you have to sing the Hallelujah Chorus. I mean, you know, it's like 85% of our members come from a different religious tradition. And so it is amazing to me how much people want a tradition of their childhood memory, regardless of it's their faith or not, right around December 24th. Right. It's a fascinating experience. And tradition is often what you grew up with. So I love yes. it when people say, are you going to sing the traditional melody? Exactly. And I'll say to them, would you hum it for me? <laughs> and they'll hum it. And I go, well, that really was from 19 1967. That was so-and-so wrote that. But you just happened to grow up with it. Well, and then the Soul Matters material also talks about something I will leave our viewers with is um, you could reflect on what are the traditions in your life and which ones would you like to keep or adapt or leave behind. And you could have any number of reasons for that. You could talk that over with people. You could think about that yourself. Um, but certainly in the lib a spirit of liberal religion, that's what we would do. Right. We would not accept any tradition blindly. Right. We would think about right. it and find out, is it helping us or hurting us, or a little of both, maybe. Right. Sometimes things are complicated. Mm -hmm. There's a great book, too. So it's called, I think it's called em oh, Embracing Our Times. Emden and Black were the, the authors, I believe. And they talked about rituals, not religious rituals per se, but the rituals we have in our life. And most of us have lots of rituals. Where do we sit around the dinner ta dining room table? Well, I have a ritual. We pray in my house for dinner, before dinner. Okay. And um, we think, uh, we say what we're grateful for. This is, to me, this is huge because to have humility and realize you're not like somehow a god, you need to remember you're finite right. and that things are precious and fleeting. And so I always ask whoever's at the table to say something they're grateful for. You know, I also say thank you for this food and this day and our time and our health. And then we always, for me, uh, think about people in need, but also people we don't know in need because I think we're part of a human race hmm. and we blind ourselves if we think, oh, I'm the most important and only one here. So I, that's an important ritual to me. And then I make everyone say something they're grateful for and they have to be serious or they like... Don't get eat. They get the mommy smack on the arm. They do. They get the... <laughs> It's a prayer. Settle down. Sometimes, so, sometimes my husband and son can't behave, so I have to like, you know, 
Be the this is the prayer. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. But, but yeah, so there are so rituals where you sit, how you mm -hmm. celebrate birthdays. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do all kinds of things. Who's, who's at your table? Is mm -hmm. part of you know, and it's interesting and, and is if if there's a death, and all of a sudden the table's different. Oh goodness! Right? It can yeah. feel very strange if if one person plays a particular role and and oftentimes um, it takes some it takes time to recreate the rituals around that. And some people find, in fact, they end certain rituals if there's a death because yeah. they're, it's so difficult yeah. to continue it without a person who played a key figure yeah. in it. So yeah, rituals are very powerful, and, and rituals, tradition. I think they go hand in hand. One is, that I think, I think that the, the, that quote from the UU, because I think it's there is a about authority. Oftentimes, I think when we got to separate those two things, we got to separate the authority from it to allow us to recreate it. We should do the hala, shouldn't we? We should do the hala because I, I love work. this tradition. This is one of my favorites. So we're going to do the wine, and I will do the wine. So if you have some wine or some juice, uh, jo join with me. We celebrate the fruit of the vine and the bounty of nature as we lift the cup and sip from it. For we're part of nature which gave us birth and continues to sustain us. Even as we depend upon nature, so do we influence its course. Through the search for understanding, we've gained the knowledge to shape our world. Guided by the best of human wisdom and the compassion of our spirit, we accept the responsibilities which rest upon us. But the taste of the wine or juice upon our lips stir within us a reverence for nature, a respect for human endeavor. Bruchim chachayim ba'olam, blessed is the life within the world. Bruchim chachayim ba'adam, blessed is the life within each person. So we say, l'chayim. L'chayim. To life. See, that was also in Feather on the Road. It was. To life, to life. L'chayim. Yeah, so it's l'chayim. Hui, so. Hmm. Bitter one. Hmm. Oh, there it is. I did that off by mistake, sorry. As the fingers of the hala, ooh, it looks fresh. It looks fresh. Ish. Ish. Okay. As the fingers of the hala intertwine, so do we join hands in our common humanity, sharing the fruits of our labors. We cherish that which has been created through human effort. For it is through the work of our hands, the strength of the human spirit, the vision of our minds, that our dreams are woven into the tapestry of time. We celebrate the accomplishments of yesterday and today, anticipating the possibilities of tomorrow. May the sharing of this hala strengthen our bonds with others who walk upon this earth. Baruch amal kapenu, blessed is the work of our hands. Baruch hazon adam, blessed is the vision of our minds. Baruch lechem haaretz, blessed is the bread of the earth. So if you have some bread, have a beat. So a couple quick announcements. So next week I'm going to post a pre-recorded service, pre-recorded, meaning that we recorded it when Bart Campolo was in town. You do. You mm -hmm. So Bart I spoke do. here. So Bart spoke here and he and I did a service together. If you don't know Bart Campolo, go to Cincinnati OJC. There's an interview with Bart. He is formerly a uh, evangelical minister, now a humanist chaplain at uh, USC in California. So he and I did a service together. I actually have a few services that I've pre-recorded. So a couple weeks ago, you might have seen the one with uh, Eric Barr, my brother. We talked about religion and illness. Actually, he's performing in Northern California. Uh, not quite yet, a little bit, not or so we think he's performing out there. He's doing a show in, uh, for a stroke association. So next week's going to be Bar Campolo. I'm going to probably post one or two. Uh, there's a couple services that I did with Rabbi Rami Shapiro. But next week is definitely Bart Campolo. You can watch his interview. This summer, some of you already know, Reverend Dittmar and myself and lots of other folks are traveling to Israel. Mm -hmm. They're fly, take a plane. And we're going to do some, I, I'm getting the equipment ready. We're going to have some conversations, you and I. We're going to post them. And then we're going to use snippets next year and next season, if you will, and congregational after the summer, so that we'll post some of those conversations. So like first impressions, second impressions, issues that you see, um, because I think it's going to be very interesting. I mean, I think. I, I can't. I'm so excited, I can't even fully imagine. Um, and I've been imagining, but I can't fully imagine. Right. Well, I think the interesting, th the, the, the thing that I'm hoping for, too, is, um, so we had that service a couple weeks ago. Well, so I don't remember now. We talked about the, we first talked about it. But I think going to a place and experiencing it and then beginning to process it, and it, it's going to take time. So it's going to be, I want to sort of record that conversation and then, you know, a month later, you know, have a conversation again. You know, what's like now that you're, sort of thought about it, because at the beginning it's overwhelming, it's exhausting, it's a lot. Uh, we've been working on the trip, I'm very excited that we worked on it again. Um, some new stuff we're doing, we're gonna go to a Templar section of Tel Aviv, the Templars we're in. <gasps> I'm so excited. Yep, so there's a lot of, because it's an interfaith <laughs> trip, so we're gonna do a lot of interleveling of that, as well as certain cultural things. So we have a lot going on, 
Next week, join us for Bart, uh, the pre-recorded service. It'll be posted right at 6 o'clock, so those of you who like to chat can keep on chatting. Look at the interview. Certainly check out our Facebook page. As we always say, share, like, tell us, other people, what we're doing so that they know that there's a bold and creative voice of Judaism that resonates with who they are as 21st century Jews. So glad you're here. We close with our final words. May we know blessings those who are near, and may we know blessings those who are far. And may the Sabbath bring its goodness to everyone soon, wherever they are. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.